Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Lessons from Leaders, which is a podcast of Lynn Gilliland Consulting, and I am Lynn Gilliland. And it's a pretty exciting um, episode for me because I have Maddie Delone here, who is just recently stepped down as the executive director of the Innocence Project, which I have heard about for several years, and I find it to be an inspiring, um, expiring work that they're doing. And so, uh, so when somebody recommended Maddie as someone that we should get on the podcast because of her own leadership abilities and qualities. I was excited and she said yes. So welcome, Maddie. Thanks, Lynn. So nice to be here. And if you could start us out, Maddie, just let us know about your own uh, journey of how, you know, how you ended up um, actually working at the Innocence Project, because what you told me, it, it wasn't a plan. You didn't start out seeing yourself in that kind of role in that doing that kind of work. Right. I've approached uh, work and jobs since the beginning, you know, maybe when I was a lifeguard at 14 (laughs) Um, in trying to do things which were helpful to others and uh, in whatever role or way I could. I entered the workforce uh, with a degree in public health and started my public health administration career as a health administrator in the city juvenile justice system here in New York City and then running a clinic uh, on Rikers Island uh, in the mid 80s. So I worked in that public health prison uh, area for a while, uh, including becoming the deputy director of the Board of Correction, which is an oversight agency in New York City that writes health standards uh, that describe the ways that people inside must be treated in terms of health services, uh, and then went to law school because I thought I would be even better at advocating for people in prison if I was a lawyer. Um, And uh, I was a litigator and a prisoner's rights lawyer for most of the next decade uh, until I realized that my way of approaching problems, the place I felt most comfortable was in a more collaborative, um, supportive, and uh, systemic way with negotiation and discussion rather than through litigation and all of the uh, battles that are uh, not about the substance, but really about delay. Um, And so I was looking for some sort of job uh, to be useful in this area of criminal justice reform. Uh, And the Innocence Project was looking for its first executive director as they had were leaving Cardozo Law School uh, to become a nonprofit. Uh, And I had experience in leadership uh, and some board experience and served on a number of really wonderful boards where I think I learned more about running an organization than I did from working in one. Um, And uh, came to the project when there were eight of us back in 2004 and left, as you said earlier this year, um, with a staff of 83 and, um, uh, you know, a bigger organization. And I'm very proud of their work. I'm very proud of my own role in helping uh, shape and grow that place. So um, it's a pleasure to be here, but that's how I got where I am. It was always driven by the mission. So you did tell me something that your dad said to you. you Oh, well, he did, yes. So, (laughs) (laughs) No, my father, when I was about 20 years old, maybe 23, um, trying to figure out what in the world I was going to do with my life, and I knew that some people had plans. I was surrounded by some very driven people. Um, Everybody knew exactly what they were going to do and where they were going to go, and my father was, to me, you know, remains in memory, one of the most... uh, important and uh, accomplished people I know, uh, I said, like, Dad, how did you get where you're going? How did you know? And how will I know? And he said, looked at me, Maddie, and he said, Maddie, it's going to all make sense in retrospect. And um, so every now and then I look for retrospect, but uh, I think you can't weave a tale that tells your own story. And uh, so when people come to me and they know exactly what they're going to do, 
um, I'm impressed by them and I say, you know, sounds like a great plan. If it works out great. If it doesn't work out, that'll probably be great too. Um, and if you don't know, well, then you're just like me and I wouldn't worry about it too much as long as you keep following your heart and uh, do good. Um, I think you can't go wrong. I, I love that story because um, for those of us that didn't, don't have a plan or think we should have a plan and feel bad that we don't, then um, we can look and go, oh, so it worked out for Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> you also told me that you asked your dad, well, when does retrospect start or something like that? Yeah, like when am I going to get retrospect? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you never quite have it. <laughs> I was going to say, do you have it now? <laughs> um, when you tell the story, there's a through line. You can yes, well, you can all, if, if you think about it for, it, it's just true. We all have through lines. They're things that drive us uh, forever. And you know, for me, it's just been a deep commitment to the people and the issues uh, that I have, you know, that I've always cared about, that I continue to care about. Uh, and I do uh, not mind making decisions and I do not, uh, and I am very interested in what everybody in an organization and a place thinks and does. I'm very curious in that way. So I think in some ways it was not that surprising that I ended up being the leader of an organization, not because I, that was ever what I needed to do or wanted to do or was driven to do, uh, but because somebody has to do it. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I found it endlessly interesting. So you just said two, several things there that, that I'm going to pull out and ask you. Um, I'm thinking those, you, you, might, you might think your leadership, your leadership attributes, making decisions, you don't mind making decisions. You're curious, so I, I'm making up that you're curious about what everybody's doing and what work they're doing. Um, and you were willing and you had a purpose. Are they, are, would you think of those as leadership attributes and, and what else would you add? to a list of leadership, what you think are make for good, your own good leadership or what you look to in others? Yeah, I think, the, I mean, I think those things are all important. Um, I, I think for me, and, and sometimes it made the work harder than it might've been otherwise, but for me, it was a deep commitment to the people who worked in the organization. Mm -hmm. um, I've always, cared a lot about everybody else. Um, and so I think that sometimes makes it actually harder to make decisions because when you make a decision that's the bottom line for the organization, um, sometimes you know that has effects on people's lives and um, you know the decisions are more difficult and, and harder to make. Um, uh, because of that commitment to the people, but I think at the end of the day, particularly in nonprofits and probably true everywhere, um, the people are your asset. The people are what makes the organization work. And so the day you stop caring about them, um, at least for me, would be the day I should uh, step down. And I didn't step down because I stopped caring about them. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it does make the decision making harder. How do you combine that caring about everyone, all your staff and being curious about them with some of the tough decisions that one has to make? How did you, how do you balance those out in your own self? I think for me, it's really at some point and, you know, I would be critical of myself on those times where it took longer than it should have, but at some point, all you have to, go on is your gut mm -hmm. when it's settled when it feels like okay yes this is going to be hard for some and harder for others and easier for someone else but it's the kind of right thing to do um and you then you just have to live with it and move on uh because i think the other thing that people look to in leaders is uh someone just to decide mm -hmm. um and for whatever, for whatever reason, and I don't think I understood it till I was just about ready to leave, or maybe even after I left <laughs> the Innocence Project, um, it is that the only decisions you have to make as an executive director are decisions that somebody else can't make or doesn't want to make. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and there are lots of people in an organization 
particularly one with, you know, lots and lots of uh, strong-willed, smart, energetic, compassionate people, everybody has a very strong opinion about what the decision should be, but nobody else is able or willing to make it for all. And so these are hard decisions that you need to make. And at some point, people just do want to move on. They don't want to wallow in the indecision. Uh, and so what you do is the best you can do. Um, and sometimes you acknowledge that's all you're doing is the very best you can do. Uh, and then when you're wrong, you apologize, you readjust, you move on. Does it feel the, the old um, adage, it's lonely at the top, does that apply, did you think? Um, I don't know. I never felt lonely, but partly I surrounded myself, both in the organization with wonderful people, um, and there really was over the years, as the organization got bigger and more complex, a strong sense for me of that team, that team of senior leaders, that team of people running departments and programs, that we were the best when we were all in it together, when we uh, compromised sometimes and lived with decisions. But I also, from the very early days, thanks to a good friend who I think was on your podcast, Bill Abrams, um, Bill uh, called and said, I'm new to being an ED, I'm new to the nonprofit sector, would you like to be part of a little group of people who can talk to each other? And I joined along with six or seven other EDs of all kinds of different uh, nonprofit organizations. And we met once a month for 14 years. Um, and that group was incredibly important to me so that I was not alone. I was alone in my you know, office, but I always had this cadre of people I could reach out to. Um, and I also was very fortunate in my 16 years to have uh, an extraordinary board chair, two different chairs, but amazing people who were also uh, had my back, were supportive, were smart, um, and I could talk to. So at the end of the day, you do have to make a lot of decisions uh, that other people can't or don't want to make, but uh, I never felt alone. Because that's, thank you for, for delving into that, because that's one of the, I don't know, myths or common perceptions that to be, that one does end up feeling alone. And so I like the senior leadership, you know, have your people that you're, that you feel trust, have that trust with, and then your, your group outside that you can also lean on. And, and just so you know, Mary Ellen from Women's World Banking was also on our podcast. So Mary Ellen was part of that circle too. Um, so, and still is. So eventually we'll, we'll circle around to your whole Okay, they're a great group. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I wonder, so do you, you must have really learned a lot being a leader, going from eight to 83 people, um, being a, a, new, a new job for you. So when you look back, what did you, what did you learn that you didn't realize? Either things you had to adjust or what? What would you have give? Maybe what advice would you give yourself? That new ED with eight people. What would you have give advice? Would you give yourself now? Well, I think it was. It might have been to trust yourself a little bit more than mm -hmm. I did at the beginning. To, um, to and also to realize that there is usually not just one answer, but you need an answer and then you will see what happens. So that the sort of, you know, it's, I hate the expression, the perfect is the enemy of the good, but that it, it applies here, I think, and that you, if you, you can overthink things from every angle, but at some point that is actually, that, that's dis that does a disservice to people. Um, and I, so I would have trusted my gut a little sooner, uh, perhaps, than I did. Um, I think one of the things I found out from that ED group, which was very helpful very early on, and if you don't have support like that, I think you might not learn it as quickly, is that the questions that you think are hard are hard. They're not hard because you don't know how to think about them. They're not hard because maybe you're no good at this job. They aren't hard for all of those reasons that people have self-doubt. 
but um, and that was very exciting to me to sort of take my what I thought were stupid questions, but I couldn't possibly figure them out to senior and seasoned people who I trusted and have them say, wow, yeah, that is the hardest kind of problem. And whether that was personnel issues with people you really adored, but who couldn't you couldn't help figure them out how to do their jobs, or it was board members who were engaged in ways that weren't, um, that didn't feel constructive to you, whatever those issues were, that they weren't, um, that you weren't alone in thinking those were difficult. So I think I would uh, trust myself uh, more or trust anyone's self sooner and, um, and find people to talk to. Um, who you respect that that uh, that that is that's true. I think the other thing that I experienced early on, but it's just it's just my nature to be in, as to pretty inclusive. I think some people would now say not inclusive enough, and it gets harder with eighty than with eight to include everyone. Um, it, is that some people wanted very quick answers. I had the sense that people wanted me as the new leader at the beginning to like know exactly what to do and to just, people would walk in the office and you would say, yes, no, no, yes, yes, you know? Um, and that I was unwilling to do that uh, because I always thought there was more to learn by listening to others who brought different perspectives. Um, and I learned to give time frames at some point. Mm -hmm. I'm going to think about this for a few days and I'm interested in what other people think and then I will come back and then you have to go back. But to build, to find a way to build in the time you need to make decisions the way you like to make them. Um, so to understand and to really try to understand what one's own decision-making process is, uh, allow it to be the way you make decisions, but to be clear about it, about that process for other people. And I think if I had articulated it earlier for some people, it would have been helpful. Um, I guess one other thing I learned, uh, just on the things I learned. Uh, this is my we, favorite part, so go on on this Going part. on, yeah. <laughs> and the, when, uh, as the organization grew, um, and because I was so invested and really knew the people so well at the beginning, um, and in many ways for a long time, uh, I, I didn't fully appreciate the need to, um, when you added positions to really let the new job be its own discrete job. I sort of allowed for a while people to hold on to some part of their job that they really loved, even if it didn't quite make sense in terms of the structure. I just thought we could be flexible in that way. And at least for me and my experience, that was a mistake. Every time I did it, every time I just didn't sort of say, okay, look, we're expanding. You can do part of it, that your job has to make sense, and the next job has to make sense. Um, it, it became a problem. Um, and so I think that the, the, in a growth, and we were lucky at the Innocence Project to be able to grow all the time, um, you just have to be you're willing to draw boundaries um, and, and make them very clear that too much flexibility in a growing organization is actually hard for people to manage. Is there something there about focusing on what the organization or the mission needs rather than what the, the people need? Is yeah, I think that is, that is certainly, I think that's a, that's a better, clearer way of saying it. That is, the issue is what, it, what is best for the organization. And I think some of the harder times over the years, and I was there for almost 16, were those times when really wonderful people who did a really extraordinary job at the level or size of the organization that it had been mm -hmm. could not make the leap or the, the jump to do it at the larger level for whatever set of reasons. And um, those were very painful and hard times. Uh, really helping people understand or sometimes they never understood and then having to let people go in the nicest way possible, uh, but who really just were no longer serving the organization well. And that uh, dual loyalty, uh, which has to be, I think, trumped by loyalty to the organization, um, those are the painful, you know, some of the more painful moments. 
Yeah, and that's, you know, and if you are caring about your staff and you enjoy them and that's one of the, the things that you love about the job, then that that's a hard, sometimes a hard transition to make, stepping back into the line of or the organization first. Right. Um, I think it's often the case for those people that they were happier in their next role too. Um, that it turns out that it was hard for them, but that's a, that's a complicated uh, moment. Uh, and right. certainly very few people say thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was probably, yes. The, that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> <laughs> but I have seen that over and over, that people, once you release them back into the, into the job market, they often find what's a better fit. That's right. It's hard to let go of that one rope and grab on to the next one. We just want to keep hanging on to the rope we're hanging on to. Right. You and I, Maddie, also talked just briefly before we um, got on the call. So this is being recorded in May of 2020. So we are wherever we are in the pandemic. Um, We're not at the beginning, but we don't know how far not at the beginning we are. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, and so you and I were talking about you you know you are no longer at this moment in time leading an organization however you are supporting a lot of executives um, people that are reaching out to you or that you know and so I wanted to I like I appreciate some of the advice that you were ideas that you were giving to them and so I wanted to ask if you would tell us um, some of the things that you're hearing and some of the your um, suggestions that you're making to the people that you're talking to. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, it's so interesting. It's been 10 weeks now for people. And the first week was total chaos. And the second week, people were beginning to feel like things, they were figuring out a way. And the third week, they were kind of able to uh, think about their organizations in ways they hadn't been able to think about. I mean, it was really it's sort of the cycle of, of change was quite accelerated. But um, and now people, I think, are tired. Uh, mm-hmm. They're sort of exhausted. They're uh, in their kitchens or in their living rooms all day long. So for people who have a work-life uh, distinction, <laughs> they didn't have it anymore in their surroundings. But, you know, somebody said to me the other day, you know, we've just, I've never had to deal with anything like this. And, and I said, well, actually, it sounds to me like you've had to deal, you've dealt with all things like this before, you know, from your desk with your team around you, but their financial issues and their programmatic issues and their new safety issues. But in fact, the kinds of decisions that people are making in this time of COVID are the same sorts of decisions that executives are may have always had to make. Um, And maybe we're just a little personally, a little more frayed than uh, we normally are, but the decisions are no different. And I think you, you only, it's like you only have that perspective when you're not in the middle of making those decisions. But I actually think it's helpful to remind people that they uh, have the tools. They've always had them. Um, and that this is just, you know, a different environment for the same series of tests. I find that just so grounding when you told it to me earlier and just now, because it it is that it's like, because the pandemic, we've never been through a pandemic, we've never been through anything. And so that just heightens the anxiety. And then what your words are, it's very grounding. No, this is break it out. You've had worked with financial issues before, you've worked with board issues before with staffing issues before these are the same it just it just look it came in a different sheep's clothing than than it looked like than before so i think that's very very grounding very helpful and often you know you listen it's it's been a pleasure actually to have the time to uh offer that myself for whatever use it is to people um in this moment to not have my own organization to worry about, um, but to be able to listen to others as they sort through what they're thinking about and doing. And, you know, as is usually the case, people know what to do. 
sometimes I think they just need somebody else to say, either to hear what it is they're actually saying, or to say that makes sense, which is all the reassurance you needed to move forward. Um, and so there's some of that. Which comes back to trust yourself, which you said you wished you had caught that earlier when you were <laughs> new executive director. So you're pretty much saying trust yourself, trust your decision, trust your gut, you know, trust right. that you'll do the best you can, trust that these are hard decisions and you just decide and then you see what happens. Right. Well, I think at the, at towards the end uh, of my time and at the project decisions would be made or I'd make a decision and and people would have whatever reaction they had to it and my feeling was and I would say I am do we are doing the best we can that mm -hmm. is in fact all we can do um, and if you do it with a clear head and a good heart um, then and the organization's mission in mind I, I think people can't ask uh, much more one of my favorite uh, leadership coaches, uh, leadership thinkers, says um, that he asks himself at the end of the, of the day, did I do the best I could? Can I hold my head up high? And if the answer is yes, then that's, that's, that's good enough. That's right. So, and I think when you didn't, you have to find a way of acknowledging that too. Because sometimes we don't, right? Right, or you make a decision, you got pushed by a force you wish you hadn't been forced, you hadn't been pushed by, you make a choice. Sometimes you just have to live with it, but it's okay to say, I wish I hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. It's what we did, we have to live with it right now, but uh, you're right, we, we could have done better. And what I love about that is that it's just acknowledging failure, which we are always going to have failure. We're always going to make mistakes. It's just acknowledging it, not getting out the cat at nine tails and beating ourselves up and knocking ourselves to our knees. Right. And I'm sure there's, you know, something about it too. I think that, you know, we don't learn. I mean, I said to staff all the time when a mistake gets made and people were anxious or worried that somebody would be angry at them. I'd say, Oh, wow, that's too bad. Um, how, do you know why it happened? Like, can you make sure, is there a way to make sure it doesn't happen again? Mm -hmm. And, um, or I wonder why that happened. And you, as it's, you know, it's an old expression also, but you don't learn from everything you do well. You don't, you learn from the mistakes you make. Um, that's where the learning comes. That's where the growth comes. That's where the change comes. Um, be, it, Cause mistakes make you stop and think. Um, you're doing a good job, you go on. <laughs> I, I think that's where innovation comes is from the mistakes. So, and I have to, th I'd have to play that out more in my mind, but that's what comes to my mind right now. Yeah. Uh, what do you think courage has to do with leadership? What do I think courage has to do with leadership? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think you, you have to be brave. You have to be willing to go out there. You have to be willing to say what you think. You have to be, a, you know, willing. You can never do the things that everybody wants you to do. And when, uh, you know, in, in the world of advocacy where we worked, you have to be able to say what others are doing should be better. Um, and you have to be brave enough to say that and uh, to disappoint people and to be a, and have people upset with you. But Sure, courage is part of uh, leadership. Do you, do you feel like a courageous person? Do you think about yourself that way? Um, I think of myself as a clear and firm person with a deep commitment to the issues and things I care most about. So, and I feel courageous, I don't know. Um, but certainly strong and, uh, and clear. Yeah, that's interesting. Because for me, I think of the work of the Innocence Project as courageous. Um. Yeah, I think, I think of it as um, uh, as just, as right, as yeah. clear. Um, there's nothing, nothing okay about uh, arresting, convicting, sentencing, 
and leaving somebody who's absolutely innocent in prison. Um, and systems have to understand their fallibility and they have to be ready, willing to admit error and to change their systems to prevent future error. And it's, it's, it's very clear. So, um, you know, and, and it, but, so I think it, it's courageous. I mean, they're extraordinary people who work there and even more extraordinary than the people who work there are the people we helped get out. Mm -hmm. The people and the families who endured more suffering than and more injustice than anyone should have to face in a lifetime. Um, and that they come through it and stay strong and ultimately prevail is, um, is a real testament to them and to the extraordinary team of or people in our organization and affiliated organizations around the country uh, and world who help get people home, bring people home. Thank you for that. And then it, for since I asked you about courage, I just imagine so many of those people, they may not feel like they have courage, but that takes courage just to persevere. Yeah, I think and, that's right. Yeah. And yeah, it makes me a little tear up. Uh, Matt, Maddie, this is, uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you hope that we would or anything else you'd like to add? No, I think we've covered a lot. Um, I really appreciate the chance to talk to you, Lynn. It's been all of our encounters uh, leading up to this, so nice. And uh, you're, you're very thoughtful and clear. And so I appreciate the chance to talk with you about uh, the subject of leadership. And again, I, Maddie, I'm so grateful that you were here. I feel honored that you came on. I've been watching the work that you were doing on the Innocence Project from afar. So to actually have you here feels a little to me like a celebrity. So thank you so much. My pleasure.